Yeah. Well, there, <laughs> there's some interesting anecdotes. Um, first of all, you have to realize that since I spent my most of my early childhood abroad, living abroad, um, I was not exposed to American racism. The children that I played with, for example, in Spain and the Canary Islands, were basically the same coloration as mine. Um, and so I had no, I was aware of that I was black. I was aware of who were some of the outstanding blacks. In fact, my mother, since she tutored me for the correspondence course, she regularly included references to outstanding black leaders and outstanding pioneers and included my father in talking about this. Um, but I had no notion of the negative dimensions of race until I came back to the United States. Uh, there's a wonderful, uh, true incident that occurred to me when I spent a brief period in a public school in Boston. And um, I had uh, the teacher, I was tested. And I was, by age, I should have been in the third grade. When I was tested, I tested eighth grade reading, eighth grade geography, seventh grade history, second grade math, <laughs> arithmetic. Um, and so they weren't sure where to put me, so they put me in the fourth grade. And the teacher in the class uh, realized very quickly that I could read better than any of the children in my class. And so she would call on me regularly if somebody made a mistake to correct them. And there was one little boy in the class who was very angry because I was, I was the person called upon to correct him. So during recreation, he came up to me and he, started, and he called me and I, I said, you're a you know, stinking nigger. And I'd never heard the word before. <laughs> And so I went home and asked my mother, I said, well, you know, he, I said, obviously he was angry, he was calling me something, but I didn't understand, so my mother explained to me. And what she said to me was, she said, that is the way in which whites use a derogatory name to call you, she said, and they want to put you in the box. And she said, don't ever let them put you in that box. You are a black, you are proud of being a black. But they can call you anything they want, but you know who you are. Now, in terms of my grandfather, uh, on one occasion, my grandfather wanted to take me down to Accomack, Virginia, which is where all the Hortons are. And so we get on the train. And when we get near the Mason-Dixon line, my grandfather said to me, he said, he said, Clifton, he said, what is the word for that's yes in Spanish? So I said, si. He said, well, he said, you speak to me in Spanish when the conductor comes along. He says, and I will say si. So I'm a little kid, and so I did that thing. So then when we get to change trains, he tried it again. I wouldn't do it. So then they made us move into the black section. Now, that, I thought, was very humorous I, at first, because, you know, what is this? I mean, why would they have you sit and change seats? I didn't realize it. My visit in Akamak was, uh, was quite an eye-opener in terms of what that world was like. Uh, amazing degree of insularity between the two groups, despite the fact that there is always a high level of miscegenation, high levels of interaction in different areas. But it was my first exposure to this and so on. Uh, but it, I became very conscious of this issue when I came back to the States permanently uh, when I was 10. And I came back to the States, my parents and siblings stayed abroad, and I went to live with my grandmother in Boston. And it was then that I began to look at the issue of race in America as a young person, watching and seeing how blacks behaved, those who passed, those who didn't pass, uh, all of those characteristics. And for me, it was almost like um, observing a foreign country. See, because I'm coming to back in the United States, I wasn't familiar with it. And I said, what is it? Why do they do that? And so I, I, uh, I studied it as a child. So I said, well, now, why do they do that? And why do they do that? And interestingly, um, one of the most fascinating experiences for me was going to black barber shops. I mean, I was fascinated by that. I mean, it was, it was a wonderful microcosm of what was going on in the black community. Uh, we also went to a predominantly black church. All of those gave me exposures to that dimension of American culture uh, and the black side. And so I, it was never a matter in my mind of uh, accepting uh, any of the stereotypic uh, imprint of racism, but rather I understood what, what was happening, but I said I would find, as I say, at first 
I thought this was the funniest thing in the world. I mean, what are they doing? Why were they doing that? You know, but still. did you did you ever come across uh, anyone uh, who your grandmother would say or indicate in some way, shape, or form that that person is passing? Oh sure. Oh yeah. Even within the family. Oh yes. Oh really? Oh yeah. I had cousins who did. Yeah. And 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 uh, from from the uh, from the Wharton side and yeah. And they would go back and forth and I, and my mother told me so. Well, you can't you know. And, that, and I, I said, oh, why? You know, I thought it was, again, I thought it was strange. Well, but, what were the, what were the uh, written or unwritten rules about how you, uh, how you interacted with them? Well, you learned that, what, what, uh, that th this was a situation. I mean, there were some, there were some who passed you just never talked to. Them. There were others who moved back and forth and recognized. And they, but as a youngster, you, you sort of, you absorb the, the, uh, the cultural patterns rather quickly, uh, uh, at least I did. You kind of think, okay, that, that's the way it is. You know? As I say, I, I found it uh, at first, uh, I used to find it rather strange. Um, and then, and at times, I said, well, that's terrible. I mean, that's ridiculous you know, to, to behave that way. Uh, but what happened, of course, I've realized now in retrospect is that purely by circumstance, I had, in, to a certain extent, been inoculated against the traditional reactions to, um, to uh, racist behavior that I was the subject of. Um, I had a, uh, an experience with um, a wonderful minister uh, who, uh, when I was <coughs> a leader of the New England Student Christian Movement when I was in college, and um, one day he, uh, we were at the New England conference and I was co-chairman and we were walking along the uh, shores of the lake and he said, uh, well Cliff, what do you plan on doing with your life? And so I said, well, I thought of um, uh, uh, going in and being a diplomat like my father. And he said, well, he said, you know, he said, you really have a gift that you probably don't realize, which is that you are a, the kind of person who can walk into any room and behave like you belong there. And people realize that you think that you do, and they probably realize that you really think you do, and you know you do, and you are. And you um, are not at all turned off by any of their nonsense with regard to race. And, um, and I had not focused on that aspect. He said, because your ability is such that you can make major uh, progress and inroads for our people in fields that nobody has ever done before. Uh, and I said, oh, you're ridiculous. No, but I, he did, and he was. It was. A, it was very interesting, uh, and I thought about this years since. That he was saying to me, "You can do many different things because you have not been uh, taken by and influenced negatively by the racism in the United States, and you know how exactly how to fight it, and you can overcome it." And okay, you know, but, and, and that was I, that's in a sense what happened. Uh, I mean, I wasn't consciously saying, "Okay, that will do that." So that um, when, uh, and even at college, I mean, I was the first black to be on the radio station. Yeah. Well, okay, no, no problem. And I was an announcer and I became production director. Well, okay. Um, when I was the first black at uh, the School of Advanced and National Studies in 1947, that was an interesting experience because um, I was um, the first black that had been admitted to the school. Washington was segregated. We all lived in the same building on 1906 Florida Avenue. And the school had a fit when I applied. Now the reason was not only because I was black, but my father was a career diplomat. I had a partial scholarship in the Department of State. I was an honors graduate from Harvard in US diplomatic history. So what are they going to say? Apparently, they told the Board of Education that when they were asked would they admit blacks, they said, well, if qualified ones apply. I applied. Uh, they really didn't know what to do. Uh, but I was in, they finally had to admit me. I was admitted. Uh, the, uh, there were two or three students who, uh, if I sat down at the table with them, would get up and leave. Uh, the dean of the school uh, used to have lunches for, on a rotating basis for the students. He never once invited me. I knew that. Um, the students, some of the students, when they discovered that uh, they could not go with me to restaurants in the immediate area in Washington, started boycotting the restaurants. That's right. Um, 
Now, at the end of the year, uh, I always remember there was one student who had been quite out, out visibly negative towards me. And at the graduation party, he came up to me, and he probably had too much to drink, but he said, he said, you know, Cliff, he said, he said, I have to tell you something. He said, when I first came here, he said, I was very, very angry that you were in this school. He said, and then when you were in the class, he said, I was even more angry. He said, because I discovered that you were smarter than I was. He says, and third, he said, I discovered that I really liked you. And he said, you know, he said, I want you to know when I get back to Mississippi, he said, I'm going to work really hard on, on this problem. Uh, to me, that was a fascinating aspect of being in that school. Now, was his name Trent Lott? No. <laughs> no. I'm sorry. No, no. But, but it was, you know, it was, but again, um, I was in a situation in which, uh, sure, uh, it was, there was an aspect of this, of racism, definitely, a lot of aspects. But when I finished, um, the, uh, the then dean of the school said that I had the second highest grade in his class. Uh, two of my law professors wanted me to go to law school. Uh, it, it was, but it was one of those things where, sure, you start with the problem and the obstacles and so on. Yeah, okay, go on through. Now I've been on the, I've been on the advisory council of that school since I guess since the 1960s. I just had a meeting just last week, uh, and at that meeting I was the oldest alumnus present. <laughs> no, but it's. That's part of the process of when you make these breakthroughs, at least from my generation. But I will have to confess, um, when I think back to some of the problems and obstacles that my father encountered, I can fully begin to appreciate his problems and obstacles. Well, because in those days, uh, if, you, if you did not, if you were drafted, you were, um, likely, very likely, to be put into extremely menial positions that had no relationship to your educational background. That was the pattern. And uh, all of my friends advised me that what you do is you select where you want to go and volunteer for that, and hopefully they'll get you there. And so I decided that I would um, volunteer to, for the Air Force to train to be a pilot, and, um, which I did. And uh, that was another experience. That, that was really something, because um, I was in that process um, really, now that was where you really got exposure to raw racism in that, in that experience. And this was 1940? 19, 19, mm -hmm. which, which year was it, 1945? 45. 45. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, Truman had not yet no, issued no, the no. desegregation and, and order. For was, and it was a case of where um, well, there are a number of uh, incidents that occurred. Um, I'll uh, mention two of them. One was <coughs> right after I was uh, sort of took my oath and was shipped uh, preliminarily for processing to Mississippi to Biloxi. Uh, the uh, we were processed, uh, segregated, and you have to realize that the. The vast majority of the young men who were being selected for Tuskegee were uh, significantly better educated. It was almost a case of where, because they only had one place to train black pilots, they got the very best of the crop. And it was a case where racism was playing a positive role. That had some interesting side effects, but um, in the group that I was in when we were being processed, they processed us alphabetically. And I was WH and WI was a young man named Williams. And Edgar Williams had just finished his bachelor's at, at Howard in mathematics with a summa cum laude. And so we're going down the line. <clears throat> and when we get to one sergeant, he looks at my uh, form. And in those days, you didn't see the form. It was always in an envelope. See them. And he said, where did you have this prepared? And I said, Fort Devens, Massachusetts. He said, well, he said, you, he said, you can get, you can be a court martial for falsifying your form. And I said, well, what's wrong with the form? You know, I, I didn't know what was on the form. So he was really getting more and more excited. And there was a, an officer sitting in the well. 
and he heard this commotion, so he came over and he said, what's the matter? And the sergeant said, well, this young man says that, that he has been to all these countries and he speaks all these languages, and he's a junior at Harvard. And um, so the officer looked at it and he said, I see you at the Harvard, I said, yes, sir. He said, did you live in the dorms? I said, yes, sir. He said, which one? I said, Adam's house. He says, how is Dr. Little these days? And Dr. Little was the housemaster. And I said, he hasn't missed a name yet. At which he had a wonderful memory for our names. And so he smiled and said to the side, said, this is obviously all right. In fact, he was furious. So I leaned over to Edgar and I said, wait, he see sure. <laughs> and he took it, Edgar said, just threw it down the table. Yeah, but that was a humorous one. Uh, the more uh, vicious ones were uh, the, uh, I guess it was the first test pilot I had in primary, uh, who was a, a tremendous racist. And he was, what he did was, um, you would get in the plane and you would go up and my classmate would go up and I'd see them make one maneuver and then they would come right down and they said, you're washed out. And then he'd take another one, go up, do a maneuver and come down and wash out. So I said, what are you doing? And they said, he gets you up there and he starts cursing at you and calling you racial epithets and terrible things. And you get so angry, you answer back. And so I had to make a decision. What do I do in these circumstances? So I said, well, my goal is to finish. I said, I'm not going to let this man stop me. So he took me up, and he started up. And it was some of the vilest language I've ever heard in my life, racial. And I just pushed my ear bones back. And I just kept following his instructions. And I came down, and we did all the exercise, came down. And they looked and said, OK, you pass. But it was, there were a lot of other incidents, but it was a very, um, um, it was an interesting, um, I guess I would call it a testing ground in the sense that how much can you put up with in terms of dealing with it in those settings. And that was, you know, it was really quite a, uh, quite something. I had no idea. And you remember the captain, of the, the head of the base was quite, <clears throat> there were a few black officers there who were pilots who had returned. Uh, when I was in basic, I had a black pilot instructor who had just come back. Uh, I've been in correspondence with them too. Um, no, it, uh, it, but it was, that was, oh, I mean, they would go into the barracks at night and, and they would harass us and brace us and so on. I mean, it was, it was very common. Uh, was, was the ultimate idea to try and, and get as many blacks to give up and quit? Or oh, by that particular pilot, I don't know. I just think he was that kind of person. I, I, don't, I don't think he had a plan. I, I, just, I, I just don't know. But the others, um, the other white, some of the white officers who were the worst, I would say that's just in their nature to sort of be very highly negative and, and trying to, and since they were your superior, uh, they could uh, treat you in a very demeaning fashion. Uh, and that was their way. But I, I didn't, um, uh, you, you recognize it for what it was. I mean, I remember one time there was one who, um, got into the barracks, and um, the, the, one of the things I have to explain is that in my particular group, uh, there were four W's who, one was MIT, I was Harvard, Williams was Howard, and another one was Bobo. We were, all, we were called the warm W's. And the upperclassmen used to get us out of line when we were standing ready to go into the dining hall to go and help them do their groundwork, <laughs> ground school work. And it got so bad that I had to, I complained to my cousin who was an upperclassman. He told me upperclassmen stopped bothering them and let them get some food. But the, a couple of the white officers discovered who, that we were there and that we had this reputation. And one day, this officer came over and he braced me, you know, put me into hard attention. And he started sort of talking right under my chin. And he said, he said you're smarter than I am, aren't you? And I said, no, sir. I said, you're smarter than I am. I said, no, sir. He said, ah, damn it, I'm smarter than you. He said, you're smarter than I am, aren't you? I order you to say something. I would say, I'm smarter than you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that is sort of the way it is. I mean, you you know, you know, do what you can. But uh, and of course, the, the, uh, my classmates who were standing nearby, they, they, they had a hard time not breaking up. You know? But it's, it's, it was, uh, as I say, it was quite an experience. Was quite he? Experience. Was he 
angry at yes. you? Oh, sure. For being smarter yeah. than yeah. than he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was obviously. I mean, I was not supposed to be, you know, smart. But he he was coming out with this to sort of, you know, really give it to me. And he felt that the best way to really humiliate you yeah, was to yeah, get you to sure. and acknowledge then, that you were like smarter. Was, then if he didn't like what I said, then he might make me do push-ups and make. Uh, but it was that was their way. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, again, younger generations would say, "Well, you know, couldn't you go and complain? Couldn't you get this, you know, stopped? I mean, this is outrageous." Sure. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, that although you realize that. It was things like this that led to some of the riots that occurred with the black troops you know, in that period. Uh, so it was not all just fun and games. Uh, but I would have to say that um, at Tuskegee, um, because the vast majority of those who were there uh, were very well educated, very often college graduates of college, you know, they, they, were, they were very, very savvy and how they dealt with it. And many, all of us had dealt with race before, races. So it wasn't anything new. Uh, and um, it was, that was, uh, that was a situation. Okay. Yeah. And how long did you remain in the military? That was about eight months, I think, yeah. yeah. And returned? Well, the war ended. Mm -hmm. And um, my instructor uh, wanted me to stay in. Uh, and I said, no. I said, I, I just have an, I actually only had one year left to finish. Oh, I stayed a year and a half to get my degree. I said, no, I said, this not, doesn't make any sense. I love flying. I absolutely loved it. But I knew that that was not a career for me until I left and went back to school. Had you decided what your career was going to be? At that point, I wanted to be a diplomat like my father. You know. I was living in two worlds. I was living in two worlds, and I knew it. I knew that I was. But it's just being cognizant of it. There was the white world. When mother would be in conversation about somebody, she'd say, she's white. And it was one of those kinds of things. But it, it, it was just very natural kind of thing. It, to live in those two worlds? Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so. It wasn't confusing to you as a young child? No, no, it's the, no not, not at all. The way things were. No. And what was the difference between those two worlds? It was one where I went to school. And, and got this marvelous uh, understanding of, of what fun the world can be and how to enjoy it and how to look at it, how to look at the world and other people. And the other was, I lived very much with my mother. I was very close to my mother. We, we, I was close to her. And it was with her, her and her friends and their socializing. And um, I went to the y, WCA to swim. And there were always the... the uh, churches always had fashion shows, and we were all dressing us up for fashion shows. And well, I went to I went to Sunday school. What kind what, what kind of little girl were you? Were you quiet? Were you mischievous? Were you what kind of little girl were you? I was New York. I was I I remember when we went to we went to Atlin, Pennsylvania, the place where they my mother took us in the summer. And you know, that was all, that was, well, no, it was, wasn't all white, but there were, there were whites there when we interacted with. And somehow I would come up, and I was always called, that's Miss, Little Miss New York. So that was kind of the way I was described. Wait, l there's something clinking. Can you it's hear me. it? What, oh, well, okay, can we move it so that it's not clinking? Oh, it's the earrings. Oh, I'll bet he loved the ladies. Mm -hmm. Oh, did he love the ladies? Oh, I'll bet he did. And they loved him too. I'll bet he did. Pull your the bottom part of your necklace down so that it's centered. Oh, oh, yeah, the pearls. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Got it. Okay. Okay. Let me know when you're Speed. when you're set. Okay. Um, we were discussing um, whether you were mischievous or or uh, what kind of kid you were. I was um, I was loved. And, it, and a little, uh, I, I was loved, had a great deal of affection as a child, and thought of um, as, um, as being bright, and se a little, sometimes a little, little, little bit fresh. A little bit fresh. Fresh, but, my, but, but um, I had good, I was known, my father used to always be, not surprised, but he was always, a, I was called sister because my brother and I, I was called, sister has, really good sense. 
One of the great pieces of advice that I remember very carefully that my mother gave me whenever there was any difficulty in my life, she would say, my dear, you just hold that little head high and stand up and never let anybody talk low to you. And did you ever have any experience where anyone tried to talk low to oh, you? Oh, throughout life? Oh, sure. But early, oh, yeah. growing up? Growing up in New York, did you ever have anyone who uh, used a Coming racial epithet? Coming into adolescence, or? I would say in adolescence, uh, as, a, as sometimes in Danbury, Connecticut, not with people who knew us, but in the street or with, with little boys, no, no, nasty little boys, that kind of thing. You'd, you'd, sometimes you'd hear nigger or something like that. You know. But that was uh, in Danbury, not, not in New York. No. No. I don't remember any racial. There was distinctions always, constantly made between white and black. Constantly. But What kinds of distinctions? Who was white and who was black in, in, in our world. And what you did that was in the white world and what you did in the black world. And how the... My, my father was... was quite fair. He was very fair. Uh, but he was very anti-white. He was very anti-white. But he and his brother, the Duncan side, was very fair. But he did not like white people. Any particular reason? I don't know. He never explained no, any particular no, incident no. or anything no. like that? He was, they were from the South, and his father had a, it used to have livery stables. And that's all I know about them, the Duncans on that side. But, uh, and he, he was all over this city. But no, I don't remember. I really don't. So the Harlem that you lived in, was, uh, was it uh, an exciting place? Was it uh, an energetic place? It was musical. It, it was... Um, it was, it was Gershwin kind of thing. It, 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 there was the pace, the the flash, the flare, the blacks, the food, the the comments were were marvelous. We used to have someone who occasionally worked for my for the undertaking parlor, and he came into the parlor, and he was talking about how poor he is. I'm so poor, I'm just going to go to that kitchen over there and get myself a stomach full of smells, because I can't afford to buy anything. I'm just going to get a stomach full of smells. Uh, just this kind of thing all the, all the time. There was a liveliness. They were poor, but there was a liveliness to it that was fun. Um, is there a problem? No? no, no. no? You okay? Yes. <laughs> okay. We're, we're, we're discussing... You're framing. You're framing. You were also there, as I understand, as a child during the riots. Yes. Yes. Tell me about that. Yes. Um, Max Smelling, during that fight with, with Joe Lewis, the blacks went wild. They were so happy. They were ecstatic. And they used to have the double-decker buses in those days, and they were opened at the top. And they were standing up in those buses and yelling and carrying on and waving their hands. And then there was another riot that was not, uh, uh, that was not a celebration. And Jackie and I used to sit in the window and watch, because we could see all of this from our window on 7th Avenue. And it was that one that my mother said, this is a little dangerous, you better come inside and not stay outside. And we had a marvelous window. The window doesn't exist anymore because I've seen it. It's not the same window as my father had. And he would stand out. He was a very handsome man. And he always wore a derby or a, or a bowler. He was always very impeccably dressed. It would take Daddy 15 minutes to put his, tag, his handkerchief in, 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 in his, his suit. But he would stand, he, I remember his standing out. He was talk about this, standing out next in the doorway next to the window. And he had a little tiny gun in his hand, and he said, if anybody comes near that window, he's going to shoot them. Then right next door to us was a Chinese restaurant, and written in great big letters in this Chinese restaurant was meat colored too. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Uh huh. And um, and what you observed from that window during the riots uh, that you were talking about uh, was what people throwing things, breaking windows. Yeah, what? they did. They 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 were rambunctious. They really were. They they beat up. They beat up and did a lot of cutting up. In the morning, New, New York Daily News. I remember there was a picture of a white policeman in a in a garbage can upside down, with his feet hanging out. Well, they were, they were, they were. I've really forgotten what the incident was about. But I think there were two major riots at that period. Two major big riots. One was the Joe Lewis, which was very happy, and then the this other one, which was quite serious. And um, you were, you were uh, a little child in, in that area uh, in the Depression years. Mm -hmm. um, how much of an impact did you see around you? of the Depression, or was it not that visible? It was visible because people, people talked about being poor, like, like this, this chap who used to come into the funeral parlor all the time. They were poor. They were, they, oh, oh, Father Divine was very much involved in those days, too. A lot of people were joining Father Divine. There were long lines uh, going into Father Divine's to get food. And the Lafayette Playhouse, too, was just coming on stream. But the, the Depression was, was very, they didn't, un, oddly enough, Duncan Brothers did pretty well in that time. Uh, there, we, were, we were doing a little better than surviving, but it was tough, as I remember.